Welcome back, everyone. We're doing more of the Ice Planet Barbarian books. We're doing book four and then five or kind of six, depending on how the series goes. But with us, not only do we have my normal lovely co-host. Hi, guys. How are we doing? We also have a small time YouTuber who, you know, she's kind of trying to build her channel a little bit. So we're <laughs> going to try to get her some views. So if you can go to Swell Entertainment <laughs> after this, that would be really good. Thank you so much for the charity. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You know, Amanda, it's we have generous hearts here. Yeah, you know, every 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 subscriber counts, every view counts. You know, it really does. And so, if you all could take pity on just a small content creator like myself, <laughs> please, guys, give her give her a break. I'm sure we'll pimp her stuff at the end, but she's Amanda from Swell Entertainment. I happen to be her video editor, so you know, go subscribe to her so I can get a raise. <laughs> William keeps me sane, honestly. <laughs> So Amanda had previously read the first three books and we read the first three books as well. And now we're doing book four and five. And my general impression was that these books are kind of an interesting evolution of Ruby Dixon's writing style and kind of represent something I think a little bit new while still also being really bad as erotica. But there are some interesting things that it goes into and we'll, we'll explore, obviously. What did you think, Amanda? Well, first, William, I think we need to call these books what they are sci-fi literature and i don't think that we should erase that these are important installments this is up there with dune and i think we need to accept that and just really tell <laughs> i can't even get through it let me let me grab my ursula k Le Guin book yes right up here with my girl ursula that's true. You know, we're going to have to break to Amanda some of the theories we have about how this technology and biology and Ice Planet Barbarians works, but I'm sure we'll get to that. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. <laughs> good we have stuff. some great theories, though. We have some, we have some good okay, stuff. Okay, good. One thing I did want to mention, because I mentioned this last time, but I just want to mention it again. We're going to make a lot of fun of the books because it's fun, but I think it's always important to remember that like everybody thinks everybody else's kinks are weird, and that includes you when other people know yours. So we're not really trying to shame anybody. If you have a pregnancy kink, even though that grosses out some of the people here. <laughs> you know, if you're into blue tails, it's okay. <laughs> We're not trying to be mean to the monster boyfriend lovers out here. We're just really being haters of media because that's more fun. And we know that you will not listen to anything. Like if we were to sit here and talk about like the good side of this one, this episode would probably be 10 minutes long and you would get bored. That's not fun for you. You want to hear us be haters. <laughs> She's going to definitely become a big YouTuber sometime. She's got the skills. Absolutely. She knows what we what you want. Exactly. But for me, as a monster boyfriend lover who loved Lindsay Ellis's Axiom's End with an alien who does not look like a human, but instead looks like a velociraptor gear, <laughs> and I was about that, uh, for me, it really is how we get to the monster alien boyfriend love. And... Uh, this ain't my kink, guys. You want a slow burn. You appreciate, you appreciate pining. You appreciate Oof. effort. I like the, the building of tension. <laughs> basic plausibility. To, to dunk all our <laughs> readers, though. Oh, the Velociraptor alien falls under basic plausibility. <laughs> oh, you would be, it's very well thought out. Very well thought out. Like, that's in I my, mean, that's in my to be read stack. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I do own uh, it. It's just, it, I need to get to it. It's good. I, it's to, good My stuff. stack keeps growing. I highly recommend. You can come back when you read it and we'll give you another okay. bump to your channel. So, um, <laughs> Um, if you haven't watched our first video or Amanda's first video, there are certain biological realities about these barbarians that are beyond them just being tall and blue. Amanda, <laughs> would you like to explain to our listeners what those are? Obviously that they're shredded. No, um, they're <laughs> basically, <laughs> they basically are quite literally a uh, rib for her pleasure. Um, they, <laughs> that's one of the main things like, hey, oh. uh, in one of these books, they share how their tongues are also so ribbed, which I was not prepared for. It. And it's not something I think I want. Like, I just... <laughs> At a certain point, it's too much. At a certain point, it's too much. You got to draw the line somewhere. And I thought that the, I thought tongues were where we were drawing the line. Guess not. But their dicks are ribbed. They are quite literally like, um, God, what's it called? What's the monster dildo company? Oh, uh, oh something um, dragon. Bad dragon. Bad dragon. Bad dragon. <laughs> bad dragon dildos. It's basically that, but on a giant blue horned alien man. And uh, they also have this fun little thing. It's described as like a thumb protruding from above their dick. 
And it's a spur is what they call it. And these things are sensitive. And it's basically like a rabbit vibrator set up without the vibrations. Like that's the only way I can describe Every it. Every time they describe the spur, and I just think of a thumb sticking out above a guy's. <laughs> I can't. Like I'm, I don't know who looked at that and went, ooh, baby. <laughs> yes. Because it's like, I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> something is, one of these things does not belong here. Me and Maria did some world building last time to try to figure out okay. what the spur is for. And you know what, we're gonna run our theory past you if that's cool. Okay, sounds good, I'm excited. I had some issues with the fact that all the spurs lined up perfectly with not only every girl's clit, yeah, but, but nice. their butt, because Anatomy doth not work that way. The, yes. the distance between is not the same, especially on every... So we threw out the whole resonances about who you can have kids with. Gone. It's whoever's spur is the right distance <laughs> to perfectly... That's the resonance. That's the compatibility. Yeah, that's how you get it. The resonance is just a ruler. It's just <laughs> a ruler. It's like, uh, maximum pleasure... We're done. Well, because like, see, my first thought with it was like, okay, if we're thinking evolutionary, because then my thought is, is that it's kind of like, it's okay, this sounds bad. It's like a hook of sorts. So like, it's meant for breeding. So like doggy style, and then it latches into your butt and it keeps <laughs> You know what? Like, you're going to get pregnant. Okay, this is actually more plausible than you think. Because, you know, ducks have, what is it, foot-long spiral penises oh, to get God. into the foot-long female duck spiral vagina. This is a thousand percent true. There's so much that I don't need to know. <laughs> like, as someone who has a thirst for knowledge, there are certain things I don't need to know. I don't need to need. <laughs> oh, I know so many great animal sex facts. Ticks do a thing called, uh, what is it, traumatic insemination. But, uh, you oh. know, so... <laughs> I knew a bunch of them at one point. This is a, I have a college degree, I'm serious. Um, <laughs> here's what's up guys, leave in a comment below if you think me and Maria's idea of what the spur is for, if you agree with Amanda. Just let us know in the comments below, engagement. It's just a lock and a key or is it a grappling hook for mating? <laughs> well, what's bizarre is that the, the female Sakui don't have a clit, so it actually and has- And they can't do doggy yeah. style. Right. Yeah, they mentioned that a couple times. Actually, you know what's interesting is I don't think, okay, so I've read the first three books. I read the fourth one, which is one of the ones we're talking about. The fifth one, which is one of the ones we're talking about. And then the sixth one as well. And I'm going to be honest, the sex as far as like how people on TikTok spoke about these books before I went in and read them, the sex is not that adventurous. No. The wildest thing about it is that the, the they're blue aliens. Like that's it. They have spurs and that's it. I don't even think they do doggy style. Do they ever even actually do doggy style? They do doggy style in the first two. The Both the first two okay. books end with doggy style. First it's okay. Georgie and Vectal going at it, watching an alien spaceship. Uh, Georgie's <laughs> like, yo Liz, blow Rahash's mind. But that's it. But you're right. Like all the girls, and I mentioned this in our first video, all the girls like it like the exact same way. And it's, it's basically like the shock factor is all the men like to give oral. And they also don't expect it, or at least that's what we see from this one. Like they were like, oh my God, why would you? What are you doing? That's not how this works. <laughs> and then the other shock, they have giant, giant dicks. Like, like again, for reference, ladies, like <laughs> right, I have, right here. I've been thinking about this. There's another biologically plausible reason that's true. So you know how we were talking about how animals with tails mate, they mate like this, or like if you're like, yes. so they need an extra long dick to get through, to get the angle correct. See, I'm that, okay. I do know a little bit about turtle dicks. <laughs> Man, why? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so apparently turtle dicks are like literally half their body length. Like that's how long their dicks are. Like they're stupid long. Mm -hmm. and, so <laughs> and so they can get it. They can sneak on in there. You know, like slide into her DMs. Slide into her show. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It is not my time to leave. <laughs> 
brought some first class content. Thank you, Amanda. You've done everything you needed to. I think what it is is that the covers look so sincere and like they're trashy romance that you assume the books are going to be super serious and like she really thinks this is hot and awesome. And actually the books kind of understand they're a little bit cringe and funny. It's not as cringe as you expect, but Maria still cringed pretty hard because she doesn't like the sex scenes. So I did much better. As you guys will remember from the first time, uh, those who watched, I uh, did not handle a lot of like, ugh, just by sheer form force of exposure, I handled some of it. There was one sex scene in particular that we'll get to, don't you worry, that really I just... Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not for me, guys. Because, like, at this point, all the sex scenes are the same. Everyone smells the arousal perfuming the air. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone tastes, like, sweet nectar, which were all the things that really put me off in the first three. There was one sex scene that did something different. It was most akin to something that happened with Rahosh and Liz, but it was the touching romantic version of that. And I did not like it. It was, we'll get there. <laughs> oh. and, mm -mm. But yeah, so I guess at some point we should talk about the books. Yeah, all right. So I'll break yeah. it down. Well, <laughs> essentially, the basic premise of this book is that there are a bunch of white 20-something-year-old attractive females. Not all white. Oh, there's one black girl. That's true. And then one of them has a French accent or possibly a Canadian accent. Amanda's Canadian, actually, so she's probably pretty used to that. I I'm not Canadian. We need to squash that rumor. Honestly, I'm not a Canadian hater, but you guys are trying to make me one because so everyone <laughs> thinks I'm Canadian. And it's just because I'm from California, but I don't have a Calif like I don't have the Valley Girl accent. And so everyone's like, you're not Californian. I'm like, yes. <laughs> All right. Basic premise, alien slavers came up, put them on their ship, but then their ship had like engine problems so they dropped them off on this cold not hoth world which is what they call it on not hoth there are aliens that are big blue and spurred to survive on that world you have to get a parasite called a qui or the girls call it a cootie it implants in your neck then you can't leave the planet but it makes you super resistant to cold and when the cooey finds that you're fertile and match up with another guy who's fertile the two you start to resonate and the sex is like Super great. And so basically in the first three books, it was the women integrating with the tribe and having a lot of sex. And in this one, we start with- Kidnapping. We go straight into dubious consent right at the end of book three. And then there we go. Ruby Dixon has a couple of like standard plots she goes for. <laughs> I resonated around the tribe and I resonated isolated from the tribe. And also I resonated and I don't like the man I resonated with. Book four is I resonated away from the tribe and I was kidnapped because that's what happened to Liz and Rahosh. And it basically starts with Harlow, who in book three was kind of interesting. She was like this mechanic lady. She wanted to go to the elder's cave. You didn't really know why, but she was really insistent on it. And she got there. She starts building a rock cutter to expand the tribe caves. And you're like, this seems like a girl with a past and a background that has some shit going for her. She's a little mysterious. Um, and any sense of mystery and personality <laughs> is immediately lost when the book starts. My thing with Harlow, and I think that was a problem that I think rose after the first three books, because you can kind of tell, yeah, there's all these women, but Ruby Dixon probably didn't plan on doing more than three. The first three books follow um, Georgie, Liz, and then uh, Kira. And all of those women are very present in each other's books. Like they're very present. They have personalities themselves when they're in the other's books. And all the other women are there, but they are just kind of there. They're there to either have already been mated off screen or they're there to try and make themselves useful because they're terrified that if they don't get mated, they're going to get booted from the tribe and die in the cold, which is super fun and doesn't at all imply Stockholm Syndrome. Love that. Um, <laughs> Harlow, I think, was like the first book where it was like, okay, well, we didn't really give her much of a personality. We gave her something. We gave her intrigue. We gave her mystery. But now we're here all the time. And then it's it's. I thought it was very interesting that she obviously can't just do like stealing away, resonating alone. Can't just do that again. So now we have even worse communication issues because even <laughs> by Sakui standards, Brooke cannot speak <laughs> at all. It's like a barbarian mixed with Tarzan horse. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> hung like a horse too. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, apt analogy, you're a writer. So, uh, Rook is, as, uh, Amanda said, he, he, he don't talk good. And by he don't talk, he don't talk at all. And he has been completely isolated his whole life. So it, the book starts from Harlow's perspective. She's like, I must save Hayden and I, I they need me. And then, Bam, blackout, she's been hit on the back of the head. And then you go to 
Ruch's perspective, the most barbarian of the barbarians. And he's like, what is this? What, what is this? This was with the bad ones. And now my chest is feeling weird and I am really hard for no reason. I got to rub one out, guys. What is, I've, I've hurt this woman. Like, is it a, it's a female, obviously, but like, hmm. So he's having, he's having an existential crisis of what he's done. And then he's like, man, I also kind of heard it. And it was with the bad ones. And you're like, oh, he thinks of the rest of the tribe as the bad ones. What could possibly have done this? And you find out that Ruch Bebe has been by himself since he was like, a young kid, kit, as they say. His dad raised him. And immediately I was like, oh, his ra- dad raised him alone in the wild. I wonder who he could potentially <laughs> be related to who we heard a similar story about. It takes them a ridiculous amount of time to realize this too. <laughs> I Considering know. the Sukui aren't native to the planet. There's a limited amount of them. It's not like there's more tribes of them elsewhere. So why? Hayden is probably the most boring protagonist since Georgie because she has... Yeah. Oh. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Harlow. 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 Oh, Hayden's a yeah, man. You keep saying, I think it's Hayden, too. Like, it's like, it's pronounced like Hayden, I think. I think you're correct. Yeah. The audiobooks say Hayden. You listen to these on audiobook? Oh. Oh, oh Amanda. And it is bad. <laughs> oh, the God. male narrator, he narrates everything. Ah, my mate. I love her, but why does she reject me? And then the sex scenes narrated by this man who sounds way too proper to, and when he tries to be a barbarian, he was like, I will take her. For myself. It's like, incre- you're like, It's the best unintentional comedy in the world. Oh, God. It's, His it's delivery is hilarious. Comedy? You gotta listen to... You owe it... To, I'll send you a clip. You oh, okay. owe it to yourself and the human experience to listen to it at some point. Yeah, you know what? I'll do it for the cringe, oh, cringe, so cringe. education. A hundred percent. All right, go ahead, Maria. Who is Rook? Rook has been... Ra- he basically raised himself. His dad died when he was young. He's been out here. He's naked. He doesn't... What's clothing? Who needs clothing? So uh, when Harlow finally wakes up, it's just naked giant blue man who doesn't speak with a like hard dick in her face a lot of the time because he's so much taller. And she, she doesn't recognize him. Yeah. She's like, I have no idea who this guy is. Like, you're not part of the tribe. What is this? He just kind of like takes her. Like the beginning part is really boring because it's basically like he puts her in a cave and starts like attempting to take care of her. And she realizes she's resonated to him. And she's like, oh, no, this no good, guys. <laughs> she starts initially trying to make plans to escape. But then she sits down and she thinks to herself, man. Oh, she sees the ship, the ship that uh, the a- evil oh, aliens right. came in. Because she's like, I wonder what happened to Hayden and Ihako. Are they OK? Uh, they might have died. I hope Kira got out alive. And then she sees a ship blow up and crash into the side of a mountain. And she's like, oh, God, Kira was on that ship. Kira's dead. The other two are probably dead. If I come back alive, everyone will think I was complicit in their death and and I didn't stop it from happening and I will be outcast. And you're like, oh, Harlow. It's almost impressive that she managed to have a whole miscommunication plot line in and of herself. That's <laughs> in awesome. and of herself. Completely. Yes. Like, nobody led her there. But anyway, she decides, you know, obviously I've, I've resonated. It's not like Liz and Rahash where Liz gets kidnapped, she's been resonated to, and she fights it the whole time. It's more like Harlow's like, well, I guess I'm stuck with this guy. You know, I'll make the best of it. I don't know that I want to sleep with him. He is very dirty and has probably (laughs) never bathed in his life. But, you know, I'll do my best. So she starts putting together a cave with this guy. She makes, like, furs. She starts tanning things. All that jazz. They've been trying to communicate. He, she, he tries to do something to her. And she's like, no, in his language. And he's like, no, I recognize that word. No. And so they start <laughs> baby communicating. Even, even the bare minimum language understanding crook understands consent. So you have no excuses any human males ever. <laughs> That's what's bizarre about these books, which is that the women and the Sakui are constantly like, there's initially a non-consensual portion of I'm going to kidnap mate you and make you fat with my child. But then when it comes mm-hmm. to the actual sex part, like they're very concerned about consent. And this comes up in book five as well. So it's like, it's an odd choice on Ruby Dixon's part. But again, I don't think the books are meant to be taken. It's a female fantasy. This whole thing, I think, okay. So here's my main thing with like the the response to Ice Planet Barbarians is I don't think Ruby Dixon took this 
these books as seriously as everyone else is taking them. Like she really did write this book because she was tired. Like I, I read her her acknowledgement in the published version. Like she really did start writing these books because she was tired of writing about angry, mean bikers. Like she really just wanted to write <laughs> men who adored women and like she wanted to write a sci-fi story and this is what happened. I really do think this was just a female fantasy and like this was her fan fiction for herself. Like in a mm-hmm. way, this was her escapism and everyone's just taking this far too seriously. <laughs> Have you ever as a woman decided <laughs> the rat race of life and dating is too much for you? Have you ever thought the men in my life do not appreciate me and treat me as the special, amazing, one of a kind object I am? Well, you should get kidnapped by aliens and go to Not Hoth, where men will love you and treat you uh, all the oral. All the oral. <laughs> yes, they do also. The requirement is that you do have to get pregnant. There is, they all have yeah. breathing kinks. Like, it will not go away. In like two weeks. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So bad. That's, that's always been the hard, the hard no for me with these <laughs> books is like, I, I, I don't even have any semblance of a breeding kink. So they're like, I have so many fears of pregnancy that this, like, imagine being pregnant on and not on not hot is miserable. I like the cold, but I like being warm in the cold. I'd be freaking miserable. On that. <laughs> and then imagine being pregnant and uncomfortable all the time. No. No, I hate it. The second half of this book must have been a dream for you. There were so many pregnant women. Oh my God. And she's also, so the thing about Harlow, which we find out later, is that she had cancer and that's why she was very much like trying to get to the the surgery machine on the Elder Cave, which is like their elders, elders crash spaceship how they got to not hot she hasn't been taking her medicine or anything like that because obviously she's been kidnapped by aliens. She apparently has not told anyone that she had cancer and that this was something that she could potentially be worried about. The hope is that the Sakui was healing it further. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like you tell someone. What if you pass out and die in the snow? You tell someone. I, this follows the kind of the tradition of the first two books where none of the girls have any life really before they land on the planet. They don't think about friends, family, careers, hobbies, movies, TV. So there really could have been more interesting stuff done with the whole having cancer and like, oh, maybe she's just happy to be on this planet because it isn't a death sentence. So she doesn't actually like miss her past. But that's really the only only element of it and it comes up a little bit later the other thing is in the first book it specifically states all the girls didn't have health problems they only took healthy women so how the fuck did harlow get here yeah this is where ruby dixon wrote a thing forgot she wrote it and just kept writing but harlow when she does get to the elders cave which is before she got kidnapped was told by the computer congratulations you don't have a brain tumor no more you is you is healthy now and she's like oh phew that's pretty good eventually in her communications with ruch and trying to make like a little cave like she's full-on housewifing it and what ends up happening is every night despite him being filthy dirty not being able to speak so it's kind of that trope in fiction the born sexy thing where somebody is obviously mentally not capable or mature enough or doesn't have the tools to understand what's fully happening which is a hundred percent ruch he does not remember that what resonance is he doesn't understand that him and harlow are now mated he ain't got none of that all he knows is that when she curls up against him at night he gets hard they just she like jacks him off at night <laughs> like and then he he like touches her and then learns how to make her come immediately he's good at it too yeah <laughs> He's well, a fast learner. Listen, we need a video tutorial on Pornhub from all of the Sakui men. And we just need... No, no, no. Not enough men to get there. Guys, what you're, you're missing the secret to being good at it. There's no porn to give men <laughs> wrong ideas. They have to learn because he literally is like, oh, when I do this, she doesn't like it as much. But when I do this, she does like it. So he is learning pure trial and error, baby. There's no porn to have infected his head and tell him I that like- I disagree on a moral <laughs> level. <laughs> I think your misandrist ideas here are at play. I think you're being kind of sex negative. I think you're penalizing sex workers. Do you want to shut whoa, down a whole whoa, part whoa, of the- We're not criticizing, we're not criticizing porn. Porn itself. We're criticizing men who take porn as 
fact. So that's what we are criticizing. <laughs> Thank you. I did my high school senior project on porn and its normalification and its effect on adolescence because I'm an <laughs> asshole and I wanted to make my teacher uncomfortable so I'd get a higher grade. So that worked. I got a B. It was great. My essay was easily D worthy, frankly. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, <laughs> okay. To be honest, I thought what you were going to say, Maria, was that there's no porn on the planet. So everything feels good at that point. <laughs> Now I'm expecting there's a, a later on book where there's like cave drawings. Like, and it's, just all, it's just all like hardcore. Like, like maybe these aren't the first humans that have come to the planet, you know, like the, Ooh. like maybe this is something else, you know, like, oh. The elder cave and then the porn cave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it also has like a supply of Twinkies or something. Cause I'm sorry, none of these women miss Indian food. Nothing. Come on. Nothing. Like there's something Ever. you want a Twinkie, you want um, a soft pretzel. Maybe. I don't know. Do they have bread? I don't think so they don't have bread they have potato like roots that they make uh-huh. hash brown cakes with and then all the weird meat you could possibly want they don't even really have like good alcohol they have an alcohol like substance i think uh tiffany mentions it. a fermented tea yeah which is just not gonna the sasa none of the three of us <laughs> like drink we're... but you know it's still pretty tragic i know right <laughs> yeah we're terrible hi oh it's like hard liquor <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> Ooh, tea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> see, I just want to see someone like find they're, they're going to start trying random vegetables and things. Someone's going to find shrooms at some point. I think the lack of alcohol is actually a really interesting world building clue. It's not it's subtle, but it's there is that the reason all the men are so good at foreplay is because there's no alcohol. So there's like, you know, they have there's to no, get the women. There's no whiskey it. dick. There's yeah, no whiskey exactly. Dick. <laughs> There's no getting drunk and making a mistake. Okay. No porn and no alcohol. We found the secret. We can fix. <laughs> the Amish have it right is what I'm hearing. The Amish have it right. <laughs> anyway, so she's basically housewife. And then at night, she rubs up against a guy who doesn't really understand what's happening. But he knows it feels good. And if he touches her a certain way, she seems to feel good. And then eventually she decides, okay, I got to get a bath. I've got to get a bath. I've got to wash this guy because he doesn't like he's got like a nest of hair. It's not like a beautiful, lustrous mane. He's dirty AF. So she's like, I'm gonna wash you. So they they go to the sulfuric water with the the weird face eater fish. She shoes them off. She gets in, she washes, um, but immediately just starts with him. And they start getting like hot and heavy. She like gets all the stuff out of his hair, washes him down. They have like fun time in the water. And then he sees, or I think while they're hunting, but at some point he sees. No, it's right after they're getting out of the bath. Perfect. They get out of the bath. She's like, wow, once I comb your hair, you're going to look really hot. Thank God. (laughs) I don't think I've ever been this horny where I'm just like, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This wild, dirty man who looks homeless. That's what I'm uh, going for. But yeah, so they're out and he sees while like stuff is happening, some of the bad ones, which is what he calls the rest of the tribe. And he immediately is like, I'm gonna kill someone. And she's like, no, 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 don't do that. They run off. And then he's like, Harlow, stay. And she's like, you don't go neither. Stay here. And he's like, no. And he grabs his spear. And she's like, you can't go kill them. That'll make them hate me even more. This is a good time to pose one of my questions that I'm known for in these videos. Ooh. Oh, perfect. Amanda, since you're our guest here, let's say that, you know, you have just gotten out of the stream with the sexy Tarzan man, and he's gonna go murder some people to distract him. Do you think, you know what would be a good idea? A blowjob. Is that your reaction? My first thought would be, has he seen my boobs yet? And then if that is, depending on how that answers, then I'd start there. Um, If that didn't work, then I'd be like, yeah, we'd figure it out. Why not? You know what? I I think, can I not suggest that we just um, like, smoke weed or something or like watch a movie like let's settle down let's take a laugh this isn't you you're not like this <laughs> i know you look at me you know like i'm and if that's not going to work then yeah you know there's a checklist once you've gotten through all the other things and if you decide the only thing that is going to distract him is a blowjob then you get on your knees and you surprise the man who luckily you have just cleaned because i cannot imagine <laughs> what a terrible experience it would have been <laughs> prior to the bath can you imagine 
imagine if this happened before the bath and she's like, I've got to do it for their lives. <laughs> and they are um uncircumcised guys. <laughs> So the smeg butt. Yeah, okay, that was gonna be m- my question was like, do these men, they know about the shampoo berries or whatever, but like, do they know how to properly clean their uncircumcised dicks? I don't know. Ruby Dixon, I need the hygiene on Not Hoth. I need a hygiene guide. I need a girl's, an American girl doll, the care and keeping of you for the Ice Planet Barbarians. That's what we need. Yes. Companion novel, world building book. I world agree. Building. Perfect. Yes. This is, yes. this is great. But anyway, so luckily post, this happens post bath, she goes down on him. He is adequately distracted and his world, he's literally like, I have been shown the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Mind blown. And then he's like, okay, she doesn't want me to kill them but I got to get her out of here. Like this isn't safe. We're going. So immediately right then and there, he's got his bag of things, all the stuff that she has spent the past couple weeks making is still at their cave. And he's like, fuck it. We out of here. So he just grabs her and starts walking. And Harlow's like, where are we going? And they walk for like two days. And then she starts smelling. Cause he's trying to describe to her. It's like water, but big. And she's like, big water. And she's like, and then she's like, waves crash. And he's like, yeah. Yeah, if you missed the dances from wolves aspect from the first of book, book we got some more. You're, you we're here for you. Oh my god. He ends up taking her to the big water, which is an ocean. It's less cold here. The the weather is a little bit less frigid. There's not as much snow. And they, they get a cave, and eventually she decides in this cave, after they've had a couple of days, there there are weird scorpion things that apparently taste like lobster. So Harlow's living it up at this point. This guy's taking care of her. Once she combed his hair, he looks flipping great. 10 out of 10. But she's also like, wow, he looks like vaguely familiar. But I can't <laughs> like put my finger on it. Huh, wild. And she's like, are you relating to anyone? And he's like, mm. yeah, he doesn't know what that word means. I don't know. Why. Yeah, like nothing. One thing that he does do during this part is he shows her his father's cave which is where he buried his father when his father died. And it's like a sweet little touching emotional moment. And his father is the person who described the rest of the tribe as the bad ones. And a lot of Ruch's way that he interacts with the world, digests it, comes from his father, who he loved very much. He shows Harlow. Harlow realizes. I actually genuinely feel like the male perspective in these books is not good to include because it just, it's so silly compared to the female one. Like in the female perspective, the Sakui are kind of like a little bit mysterious and funny, but like in the male perspective, they're super dumb. But in this case, Dixon actually does some kind of interesting things with how he thinks about his father and there's actually some like mm-hmm. emotionality and internality to him which is uh, going to be interesting in the second half but it's like it's a it's a new thing in the series to have these kind of complicated emotions so yeah eventually Ruch has another brain blast where he remembers what resonance is and he calls Arlo his mate and she's like oh, you know now and then she's like I guess we have to do it and this whole time she's been like I don't want to do it I don't want to do it. We're not going to have sex. We're not going to have sex. We'll do all the other stuff, but not sex. And then she has a bad dream. And in her dream, her tumor has come back. And her body's like, this is what you get because you're denying your queen. You must have sex or your tumor shall return. And she wakes up and she's like, God damn it. It's a good thing he looks hot now. <laughs> anyway, and so then he, he remembers what mating is and and like she's like, oh, he loved me. And so they do the thing. Everything is happy. And then you- Whoa, 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 no. What's weird about this scene where there is that she has to explain to him through their limited language what, both how he's supposed to have sex because he doesn't know what goes in where and what shoots what. And also while they're doing this mid- coitus she has to explain the whole concept of children i forgot it's it's wonderful it's hilarious and like i appreciate that ruby dixon understands that having a child is a form of like more than like she needs to get his consent right his informed consent on this issue Mm -hmm. but maybe do this not when you're mid coitus because just tips for women out there who meet tarzan men (laughs) they're not in their best mind when they're uh you know mid mid insertion and that's basically what happens because he's like how does the kit get inside the because she says like she mimes to him bebe and he was like oh we're going to make a kit how do we make a kit i don't know and then she she like basically tells him it's his sperm and he's like ah so i take it and then i put it inside <laughs> <of his laughs> I forgot about that. 
And she's like, no, 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 you silly. And then finally, as as insertion happens, he's like, oh, this is how I shall make her round with my child. See, but see, he understands that, but like he doesn't understand the- He has very selective memory. Yeah, and even then I like, I shouldn't question the logic of men. <laughs> what is with all this man hate on here? Jeez, I did not know there's gonna be so much misandry. Don't go subscribe to her small time channel. Okay, she doesn't need a voice in proceedings. Anyway, so then there's a one, they do the do, and there's a one year time jump. And Harlow is very pregos, very like swollen foot, a pain on her side. Uh, and it opens with actually what I thought was a really cute scene. It's her going fishing and she's got her fat little swollen feet and she puts them in the icy water because it feels good. And then she stabby stabs some fishes. <laughs> and then she has to waddle back to the cave. And then he's there and his English, or not his English, his sakui has gotten better. And he's like, ho, oh, my mate, how are you doing? And she's like, I'm tired. I'm going to go really quick through this part, guys, because number one, it's not as fun to make fun of, but I think it has much more to talk about about the difference between what is about to happen and everything else in the Ruby Dixon canon. <laughs> yes. Because I thought the last third of this book is a from a different world. It's a shift. The thing about it is it's kind of like, this series a lot is like fan fiction in terms of both the serial nature of like, it's basically the same couple meeting again and again, which you in fan fiction, you do all the time. But also in terms of like, this was a smut one shot that all of a sudden she started delving into the psychology of one of the characters. And like, that's what it is. is she kind of got off topic thinking about his childhood issues. And so like, she forgets for them to have sex. But she, cause they kind of have sex. Like in the, in the start before things really kick off after the one year time jump, they do have like a sex scene, but Harlow's not doing great. She's getting some headaches. She's really tired. She's got a pain in her side. The baby kicks and sometimes it really hurts her. And he's like, wow, my mate isn't doing too great. I hope this baby comes soon. And Harlow's like, I am ready. It's been 12 months. Get this fucker out of me. <laughs> There's like no concern over the, the birth itself though. Like, I'm sorry. I think anyone with modern technology or not, with all the drugs on the planet, on not hoth or otherwise like there's still fears with the birth process and i don't think these women ever experience that harlow is way too chill about no. i'm gonna give birth in a cave alone with a man who doesn't even really understand how basic biology works this. like is he gonna know to even catch the baby yeah what if there's a complication you know like and she she had cancer like there's effects that chemo has on the body cooey or not you know helping you oh yeah that's true there's risks with pregnancy once you've gone through some Thing like that and there's that's just never a thing that's discussed never brought up but what does happen is uh, a sakui from the tribe hunting party comes in to collect some halt oh, halt salt the salt hunting party of course Ruch is like the bad ones are here mayday mayday I must go make sure they're not like he, he throws her into the cave he runs off and she's trying to hide and there's a there's a hidey place but her Belly's too big, so it pokes out. So she's like, fuck this. I'm just going to sit. I'm tired. <laughs> and then Liz appears. And Liz is like, yo, girl, Harlow, where have you been? Like, bitch, you're pregnant. You don't look good. She literally does that thing, which you never want to hear, where she was like, wow, you really don't look good, hon. <laughs> like, what's up? And then she's also like, where's the guy? Uh, are you okay? Has he kidnapped you? And she's like, because the answer is yes, he did kidnap me, but it's currently like, no, I'm happy now. And we're very much in love. He's not. A well, you think Liz would understand of anyone? Yes. And, and that's why the fact that she didn't tell Liz, all she had to do was say, you know, Liz, you know, how Rahosh kidnapped you. And then you fell in love with him and you're very happy. Funny, same thing. <laughs> Notice how Stockholm Syndrome is like all of our kinks. Like, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> Who knew? Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> but Liz is like, you really don't look it. And she's looking at Liz and Liz looks great. Her skin's glowing. She's wearing a cute dress. I don't know why in this weather, but whatever. Was she pregnant or had she already had her baby at She's this point? pregnant because that's yeah. the thing. Okay. When she's like, of course I look bad. I'm pregnant. And then like Liz turns and it's like, but I too am pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> and sh she's immediately like, God damn it. And then she was like, yeah, everyone's basically pregnant right now back at the tribe. We're doing great. And then she's like, wow, I guess being at the tribe would be kind of convenient if you're pregnant. And they start talking. And then she was like, no, you have to come back. And then, of course, Ruch comes in and Ruch's like, you get away from my mate. But at this 
exact moment. Harlow has like a dizzy spell. Her head really hurts. She's in a lot of pain. She faints and Liz is like trying to help and Rook's like, don't touch her. And Liz is like, fuck you, asshole. What are you doing? You've kept her in this cave by herself this whole time? You abusive shit. And like, she's literally yelling at this ha- like armed giant angry man, which is very Liz. And then eventually Harlow comes to and she's like, you need the healer and you need the healer now. And Rook's like, oh, they have a healer. Cause he's like, I hate the bad ones, but I really love Harlow and I don't want her to die. And she's carrying my child. What's a guy to do? Liz is like, we have to take, there's no choice. And then he's like, bring the healer here. And she's like, are you crazy? There's like 10 pregnant women. We can't just bring her here. And then Harlow's like, I guess I I might have to go. And then he's like, fine, we'll do this. And then Liz is like, great, I'll bring Rahash. But I'll tell him to leave his weapons. And everybody's like, okay. And then Rahash walks in and everybody does that. (laughs) because like Rook goes why do you look like my father and Rahash goes why do you look like my father Rahash is like I did have a brother named Maruk Harlow's like Rook that's part of your name (laughs) your name is part of that name and they're like oh shit brothers but like the two guys have completely no reaction to this news the girls are like we're family now and the guys are being all stoic about it so they start traveling back to the cave and the whole way he's like wow you know they're actually being kind of nice to us but they're terrible and I hate them and my father said they were bad people and he wouldn't have lied to me. This last third is literally Ruch dealing with his childhood trauma of his father isolating him, feeding him information that puts him against everyone else of his species, coming to terms with that because to deny that is to what he thinks reject his father and deny his father and to uh, spit in the face of everything his father did for him. And so it is literally just the reconciliation of him loving his father, but also realizing his father fucked with him a little bit. It requires a degree of emotional intelligence that Ruk just logically would not have at this stage. <laughs> it just logically would not have. It's an interesting emotional situation. I and mean, Ruby Dixon does try to do her best to write it, even if she's not necessarily great at writing this kind of thing. But it's so out of place in the series. It's like a breath of fresh, complicated air. You're like, oh my gosh, there's growth here. And it also makes you realize how simplistic Harlow is as a character, because she's just like, I'm just the pining, beautiful wife who might die in, you know, childbirth. In childbirth. That's literally like, that's Harlow. Like, Ruh is going on an emotional, like, journey, almost a little bit of actualization, overcoming trauma. There's a whole, he bonds with Rahash, because at one point he shows Rahash his dad's cave before he leaves. And Rahash is like, ah, you know, and he tells him the story of their parents, and he's like oh wow he kidnapped our mom too wow who knew so many kidnappers in our family but also the important thing is he he realizes that he dad gave Rahash to the Sakwi but kept him and so there's kind of this thing where they're both kind of angry at their dad the one is like why did I have to be raised alone and isolated and the other one is like why did you keep him like what about what about me papa and then he also realizes that his Kui was got at the expense of his mother and of Rahash's fucking face. Because how Rahash got fucked up was his father tried to, with only mom and himself, take down a Sakots, which is the giant like beasts that do nothing except carry Kui. Um, <laughs> and that's how Rahash lost his horn and got all of his scars. It connects to later because eventually they get, they get to the tribe. Vectal is a dick for no reason. Like here's this man who barely spoke anything a year ago. And Vectal's just like, why are you here? Did you kidnap her? Blah. Like did nobody tell him that this guy was basically Tarzan? <laughs> that seems like something that Liz, like even if she's concerned about Harlow, like that's something that Liz would be like, listen here, you big bitch. <laughs> And give him the lowdown. Yeah, where she literally has to like step in on a fight to keep them. Like she was like, I'm glad I helped uh, calm down the dick competition. Um, <laughs> yeah. Rook gets to a point where he's like, she has to stay here because he finds out from the healer that the reason this pregnancy isn't going well is because her tumor isn't actually gone. The Kui has just been keeping it at bay, but it cannot do both having a baby and keep the tumor at bay, it is really tiring itself out. And the healer has to help with her Kui Harlow's Kui, which makes the healer tired. And so it's not a great situation, but he realizes that like, she's gonna probably have to stay here forever. He's like, well, I can't stay here with the bad ones. And he's like, am I gonna abandon my mate and my child? Like my dad abandoned me or or like, uh, like my dad abandoned Rahosh. Like, what am I gonna do? And he's having this whole like crisis of faith. And eventually like the baby's born. He's so happy. And Harlow's like, you're not gonna leave, right, babe? And he's like, uh, and she's like, you're not, 
you're not going to leave. It's like it's like that meme with uh, Anakin and uh, Padme. <laughs> it's that meme. And anyway, then they're like, we need to go get him a quee because the baby ain't doing too hot. He's like, he cries, but it's not like strong, healthy baby. Well, and he came early too. Because what happened is that Harlow's uh, quee was trying to fight off both the cancer and take care of the baby at the same time. And so it was overtasked. And that's why she was having all those health problems. And she stopped producing nutrients for the baby. So the baby just, they were like, eventually the baby will get hungry and just try to get out of you, which is a terrible way to describe that. (laughs) (laughs) That's terrifying. Oh God, no, yeah, I hated it. I hated it so much. It was real bad. Um, But anyway, she has the baby, everything goes fine, but they're like, we need to get a queen of him ASAP. So they go, they find a Sakots, and during the, the fight, and he's like, wow, look at this tribe. This tribe is risking their lives to help me and my baby. And he's like, and look at my brother. My brother is literally risking his life, which means his kid might grow up fatherless for my kid. And in that moment, he thinks about abandoning his kids and he realizes how shitty his dad was to abandon Rahash. (laughs) He was like, wow, that really was the dick move. And he's like, I will never do it. It's sorry, dad, you were wrong. I'm going to stay with the (laughs) tribe. They get the queen. They put the queen in the baby. The baby's fine. And Rook went on an emotional journey of learning that he could love his father, but acknowledge that he wasn't a great sakwi. It doesn't end with doggy style disappointingly like the it, first two It books. doesn't. They have, <laughs> they have a sex scene. Like for this entire last third, there's been no sex scene until the very, very end where like they leave the baby with someone or like Georgie's like, you need to get laid, girl. I'll take the baby. You go, you go do that. Victal says he's being a uh, dick on hunts. Like he's not, he's not doing good. You please go take care of that. Do your duty as a woman on this planet. Public service. <laughs> You've birthed a human hybrid alien, <laughs> but now it's time. You're only just feeling better. You just showed <laughs> us all what we have to look forward to. The most terrifying of all time, which a child trying to escape from her made me think of like an internal C-section and I wanted to die. <laughs> <laughs> like they were genuinely horrible, mm-hmm. genuinely. They awful. to at one point describe placenta as like baby meat or something like that, which yeah! I was like, oh, that what is terrible. that? That is absolutely not how I wanted to ever think about that. Also, in the birth scene, we find out something very important, which is that the babies have a baby spur as well. So now we know that it's not a secondary sexual characteristic; it's just a thing they have from birth. From birth. <laughs> So I think we should just I think we should just skip ahead. <laughs> okay, so we we have officially spent fifty eight minutes on one book. We're gonna try get through. It's, it's, wait, sorry, I'm sorry. I thought of something. The fact that the spur is a um, dominant trait in <laughs> that character. <laughs> Yeah, no, that is a fair point. I want to see the Ice Blind Barbarian's Punnett squares, okay? I need to see how this all works. Because all the babies look different. That's the thing that we see the further on we get. Some have horns, some don't. Some have, like, furry skin, some don't. Some are really blue, some are not super blue. So in the next book, we take over from Harlow and Rook. We actually don't even really see them. Now we're in the Bachelor's Cave, because there's, like, a... Married People Cave and a Bachelor's Cave. And this one is about the Bachelor Cave where we have Tiffany and Rosie. They're not Rosie. I always want to say Rosie. Josie. Josie. Tiffany is unique because she is the one black person on the whole planet. What happens is that her and Josie are the only two who haven't resonated yet. And everybody wants a piece of Tiffany. And it's not really explained why nobody likes Josie. I really liked Josie. I don't know why she gets so much shit for no reason. She's outwardly herself and Tiffany keeps to herself. They're like, oh yes, the perfect maid. She's quiet. That That's really, it, that's what it seems. <laughs> like Josie is loud. Josie is me on this planet where she's like, what can I do? Tiffany is like, okay, I kind of want, she's from a farm. Like she's very capable. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, oh yes, she'll make a good mate. The reason that Josie hasn't resonated for anyone is because she is an IUD. And and she's trying to keep that quiet because it's kind of like they they already know that birth control, you cannot resonate on birth control because one of the other girls had been on it when they crashed. It took her several months to resonate for her mate because the birth control was working. It's out of her system. She has not lost her IUD and the surgery machine is out of commission so she cannot go and get it removed. Well, and poor Josie, which the next book will be about. You two have read it. I haven't read it and we won't get to it this time, which I actually kind of want to read it because again, I kind of like Josie. I liked Josie. She was a foster kid. She really just wants family. She's the only one of them who keeps thinking about wanting kids, which it's weird how okay the others are with kids, but also don't think about it beforehand. So that like feels a little bit more. Kira was the only other one who was really like, I want Bebe, but I cannot have Bebe. Yeah. But anyway, we're talking too much 
much about Josie. This book ain't about fucking Josie. I know, I know, I know. This is about Tiffany. Tiffany's whole thing with why, well, okay, so she doesn't even fully know. I think it was very clear where she just, she was so against intimacy and the concept of mating and the concept of having a child with literally anyone that she, it was so terrifying to her that her cooey was in a sense protecting her, which gave the cooey way too much. I don't know. It <laughs> seemed a little, it went against its own lore, I think. Yeah, because the cooey doesn't really seem to care about fertility. I mean, besides spur to clit ratio, it doesn't really seem to care about their feelings too much. So it's odd that like all of a sudden it would care. Seems almost like a psychosomatic thing, I guess you could say. I mean, maybe you could say like, cause like who's to say mental illnesses and mental trauma is not as affecting on the body as any other illness that perhaps the queen would have to deal with slowly uh, to allow for... Even then it's like, okay, so I always go back to the first book when Vectal resonated for Georgie even before Georgie had the, the cooey. That still doesn't make any sense to me. And then in this book, it's like, okay, the cooeys aren't resonating because Tiffany is not ready for that. And it will, she'll leave. Like she straight up says, I will leave if that happens. And... Then how do you pronounce his name? Souk? Saluk is uh, her mate and all of that. There's no reason that he would not resonate for her if Vectal had resonated for George. Exactly. Yeah, good point. So um, um Tiffany, important the thing, reason- Do you want to go into it? Would you like to go into it? I've talked a lot. You do talk a lot. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know what? The Sukui men would never treat us this way. They would <laughs> not <laughs> that to me. Anyway, um, the reason Tiffany is so against intimacy and everything was she was one of the girls and again you might remember from the first book the first book opens with a weirdly like tonally dissonant assault scene that's like not graphic but like mentally you're like it's whiplash it's like it's like a slap in the face you are not prepared for it no mm -hmm. one warned about it when they're promoting the book nothing it's and, and it's, it's at war with the rest of the tone of the book yeah because as will said the, the books do a really good job of not taking themselves too seriously and then there's this moment and you're like oh that's too serious but anyway tiffany you find out is one of the girls that had that happen to her which she kept from all the other girls like somehow everybody was asleep when it happened to her and when she comes back they're like what happened and she's like they examined me on an operating table and doesn't tell them so she has a huge fear of being touched intimacy so the fact that there are four different guys vying for her attention constantly bringing her gifts constantly trying to get her to be their mate like and just all the time it's like Duh, duh. And she's like, no, 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 no. Scared little trauma baby. And that's Tiffany. Tiffany is scared little trauma baby who has a lot of problems. And the idea that her body is suddenly going to betray her and a man is going to look at her as his and she won't have a choice in the matter. And then he's going to want sex. And what if she doesn't want sex? And what if he forces her because she wants sex? Tiffany's got a lot going on in her head, guys. Oh, one of the guys at one point is like, oh, I'll just steal you away until you resonate for me. And he says it like a joke and she's terrified. Like she's so horrified by it, which is, I think is the logical response to have to a, a man on a planet where you know that has happened. <laughs> yeah. Being like, I should just steal you away. <laughs> until you resonate like, well, for me. That's, that just seems like a fun thing to do. How, how does that sound? I will say that as a whole, that kind of character dynamic with her actually kind of worked for me in that like I did find my Self liking her more than the others. And Ruby Dixon, again, is not a very good writer. She's not a nuanced writer, but I felt like she handled it relatively appropriately. Some of the decisions that Tiffany makes later kind of make sense in terms of she is terrified. She is having that post-traumatic stress response of just freezing up. And so, you know, I'm a dude. Spoiler alert. But there is an interesting thing, you know, I've heard, you know, I have female friends and I've heard them talk about it and stuff it, where women feel like they owe men their attention or can't say no or like they you know they can't like take them out for a date and then not get laid like that whole dynamic and i thought that was really interesting because this book actually kind of talks about that a little bit and that's why she can't make a decision for who of the competitors she wants to win yeah and i thought that was weirdly uh a adult for the book. Something that actually happens with women. Yeah. She doesn't tell any of these four guys like, hey guys, please stop. You are literally destroying me inside. And she just lets it happen and she quietly does it. And the only guy who realizes that Tiffany does not like it when you are overt when with your courting is Saluk, who's like, 
Ah, there's my mate. And so what's happening in his head is completely at odds with what Tiffany thinks of him as a person. Yeah. He's like, there's my mate. She's a skittish gal. <laughs> you have to approach her very slowly. And then there's a, I literally highlighted it. I can't just court her. I must sneakily court her and just make sure she knows I am. He talks about it like a hunt. Yeah, he does. It's creepy. Yeah. It's not- good and like he's a good guy like he's painted as a good guy it was real weird but yeah so he comes up to her and he's like hi friend tiffany how are you doing today and she's (laughs) like oh saluk the guy who is just my friend he never pushes me he obviously doesn't want me Ah, i'm comfortable around you eventually for some reason she decided decides while she's trying to plant because she's trying to develop agriculture on this planet guys she's from a farm and while he's helping he somehow gets out of her something that not a single one of the human women she's been friends with and going through intense trauma with for a while now she isn't able to tell them but she tells this guy that she she was assaulted And so she's really scared of men and touching men and having them touch her and the whole nine yards. And he's like, well, you might have to eventually, because she's like, I don't want to resonate. And he's like, you know, at some point you might not actually have a choice. You might need to come to terms with this. And she's like, you're right. But how do I do that? And then she's like, can I practice with you? And and he's like, it was so out of left field. I also would have fallen on my ass like he did. I would have just been like, wait. (laughs) Whoa. He's, He's like, my deer in the headlights, what? <laughs> Although I did like his reaction because he thought about it for two seconds too long and was like, I'll think about it and then books it. <laughs> he does. He just he just fucks off. And she's like, well, obviously he doesn't want to. And so I guess I've just been rejected. And I'm like, oh, girl. <laughs> Give him a minute. Uh, we should point out there was a time when they first got to the planet that one of the other men who has just immediately stopped trying to court her was kind of like being very nice to her and was like, why don't you just come spend some time with me? And she was lonely. And then he simply brushed her arm and she lost her mind and screamed. And she just told everyone she wasn't prepared to see the spur. She thought it was a joke. <laughs> he does not come up any else in the, anywhere else in the book. And I'm like, why? That would have been a good, if we could have chosen anyone to like kind of work through this, that would have seemed like if, from a storytelling perspective, the, the whole story plot of this one is like healing trauma basically and healing that with someone. So it's like, I don't know, maybe you try traumatize this guy we could have had a good (laughs) you know again ruby dixon is not really here for growth and character arcs but that is a really interesting idea you know of a man kind of having to decode his toxic masculinity i'm woke (laughs) in that way of you know understanding that like there is more going on she does have trauma what does that mean what do mental scars mean in a world where like everyone is so you know he's sakui like sex is such a not big deal to them that i think that would have been a really interesting journey but i guess she just wanted the comfort of like oh this man is devoted to me from day one and super gentle all Mm -hmm. the time which you know that's what the books are here for while that happens she's Josie has decided to help Tiffany because Tiffany's like, I can't stand these guys. I'm going to run away. And Josie's like, please don't. Then I'll be the only woman who's unmated and you'll leave me here by myself and my ver- my worth will be incredibly low. And you're like, wow, Josie, you also have some issues you have to work through, my dear. She also has been assaulted. We should point that out. It's yes. very, it's not a thing. Even in her own book, it's not even really a thing. It's very weird. Sorry, Ruby Dixon, I'm going to throw you under the bus. It was like, okay, that's enough assault talk for <laughs> one series. Um, we're just going to keep making it like as the second bullet point in a line of parentheses and then that's it. And it's odd because the contrast that's drawn between Tiffany and Josie is that Josie always looks to the future and she kind of forgets what happens behind and she's always looking forward. And that's actually kind of a really interesting idea that maybe she's like that because of what happened to her and that's how she's dealing with the trauma of it because people do deal with trauma in different ways. And it's not addressed. <laughs> not even in her book. Josie decides to help Tiffany and get these men off of her back. She's going to create a bachelor style competition that she will run and it will keep the men so busy, they'll leave poor Tiff alone. And so she gives them tasks like who can hunt this thing the quickest? Who can make the most rope? And it's she's also being helpful to the tribe because it, she's having them do practical things that will help the tribe and like store up meat for the bitter season and tiffany's like this is great and then josie's like but at some point you are going to have to deal with the fact that i told them there's a prize and they get to escort you us to the elder cave so just you know keep that in mind (laughs) and and she doesn't eventually uh so luke is like okay i'll do it and she's like okay we'll do it. And then he's like, what are we going to do? And she's like, well, you know, because he originally, he's like, I didn't want to because I wanted my first time to be when I was resonated. And you're like, that's oddly 
sweet Saluk. Nobody else in your tribe thinks this way. <laughs> Whatever. And she's like, well, don't you want, like, the first time you sleep, like, you know how to pleasure them? So it could be practice for you as well. Mutually beneficial. And he's like, ah, uh, yes, this is true. But he also just wants to do this. He just didn't want to freak her out. So he also knows that, like, though he thinks that she's his mate, he knows that she has not resonated. And there's all these men fighting for her attention. He's terrified of like them essentially mating and being together and then having her resonate for someone else and ha- losing her. And it'll, it's like, will that be worse than if I just never slept with her at all? And specifically that she'll get really good at sex and then with him and then bring those skills to somebody else, to someone which else. he thinks about. Anyway, so they decide their code word is gathering herbs and they keep telling everyone they're going to go gather herbs and they find a cave and like they start with kissing. It doesn't go well. She freaks out. He ends up just holding her and she really likes just being held by this big giant blue man and so for a couple like a week or two they just and he has a heart on the entire time time. (laughs) every single time he's just hard as a rock rock. but it's just like it's all right i'll just stroke your back because i'm not in like pain or anything it's fine (laughs) and she like she knows like because she's straddling him like like wrapped around him her legs on either side so like she, she does know. But eventually, like, she's like, you know, I, I enjoy this. I do want more. But, you know, I am. It's the touching. I'm scared of the touching. And he's like, well, what if we didn't touch each other? And she's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if we just touched ourselves? And she was like, oh, masturbating. And he's like, yes, I do it all the time. In fact, thinking of you. And she's like, this guy is just my friend <laughs> who knew but she she likes it she likes the idea of this big burly man hunter guy touching himself thinking of her so she's like okay you first buddy and this is this is where maria began to die <laughs> at first it was okay she was just like he was like what do you want me to do and i'm like oh no just i don't like that <laughs> and, and she's like um stroke yourself and he's like how do you want it and she's like slow and then (laughs) he starts getting into it she starts getting into it but she doesn't touch herself she just watches and then he's like what else do you want and then she says i hate it it (laughs) she says touch yourself slowly like i was touching you and he runs his hand across his butt. Yeah, she's like, play with your nipples. Yeah. And I, I was out. That's I literally texted my and I was like, I can't. I can't. <laughs> well, like, I think also in some of her flashbacks to when she's talking about like the farm and like getting boys in her room and stuff, like she talks about the fact that she, it seems like she's had sex before. Like she's had relationships or at least sexual encounters previously. And then the assault happens. And that's now changed her worldview. But then this scene, it almost seems like she's never seen a dude touch a stick before, <laughs> ever. Or like a, a, a dick has never been in a hand around her before. And it's like, okay, there's too much changing going on. She's like, I don't know how guys jerk themselves off. Yeah. It's like, really? <laughs> do we, are we sure? Are we sure? <laughs> do, do you, you want to reread that one chapter again? Do you just to remind yourself? And then she touches, she gets naked. She She's very comfortable being naked around him, which on one hand, I think if they had reminded us again, that on not hoth the sakui have no problem with there's no modesty really so like oh they all basically bathe in the same cave they've seen the women naked also the fact that none of them seem to bring that up enough like like i guess they wouldn't mind but then she's also like she's turning around and showing him her butt and like she doesn't seem to have an issue with being naked around him and he's like losing his mind looking at her and it's like okay but like this is against the like culture of the tribe that has been established at this point. It wouldn't be that titillating to him. Also, she has like a leather bra, which is hilarious. I don't think it mentions that she's particularly well endowed or anything like that. Like Josie, we get noticed that she's very small chested, but it's like, it just seems like it's like her own modesty. Like she just like likes having the bindings there, which if she had mentioned that, that'd be nice. But it's like, <laughs> none of the other women seem, they have no problem freeing the nip. It's just, it's just <laughs> Tiffany. Just <laughs> Tiff. But anyway, so they do that thing. That goes relatively well. One night she's having nightmares because she has nightmares all the time. And she wakes up from her nightmares and Josie's like, well, girl, you haven't had nightmares in a while. And in her head, she's like, it's because I've been canoodling in a cave with a man. <laughs> she mentions to Josie that like, I could probably sleep better if Saluk was here. And she's like, bitch, just go get him. Like, what's the worst? that could happen. So she goes and she asks Saluk to come sleep with her. Again, 
in like these are public caves. Like you have your own private <laughs> cave, but to go get him, like she had to. Pass. They have a privacy screen, which is basically like a piece of hide. Like that's it. Like good luck. There's no soundproofing in these caves. They'd be <laughs> terrible for vlogging. That's it. <laughs> it would be. He comes to the furs. They lay together. They cuddle, and then I think he he fingers her or she jerks him off i don't know something happens she's gonna blow him he freaks out he's like that's not a thing she jerks him off and sticks it's like okay clearly if i blow him he's gonna want to go down on me and i'm not ready, ready for, that. for that which is you know a very realistic dynamic sukui men are built different <laughs> i also want to point out josie is a real soldier about this she sleeps through i do we have I think she was asleep. I don't think she was asleep. That is a good point. Because she snorts at one point and it, she's snoring and then she snorts. I'm like, that's her laughing. She's oh. like, absolutely. But like she caught herself. I mean, that would actually be introducing a kink beyond the really vanilla sex they all have with their blue aliens. I don't know why there's no like... Anyway, we're, we won't go down that route. Anyway. <laughs> you just want a blue alien orgy is what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm just saying it's there and she never goes down that route. And I don't understand. This isn't that kinky guy. I'm just saying, you know, I think those alien blue alien men would be okay with sharing. See, especially when you have the modesty thing where like modesty is not really a thing. And yeah, there's the possessiveness, but also it's like, wouldn't you also kind of be like, oh yeah, see how I claim my mate? Like, oh, why yeah. are you not doing that? Hot wifing. At least just in the same room, yes. you know? Like, yeah. that's, that's all I'm saying. I don't expect them. And they're really used to seeing each other's dicks. So like, they don't, exactly. there's no yeah. homophobia on that side. Anyway, so the next morning, so Luke's like, I gotta scurry out of here because my Tiffany wants to make sure nobody knows we're, we're doing things and I shall respect her wishes. But then, of course, one of the guys who's competing for her sees this. They get into a fist fight. A Hako, who's the leader of this subset of the tribe, is like, what the fuck's happening? And the guy's like, he was in her furs. And he's like, she's my mate. And everybody turns to her and she's like... She just says nothing. And they're like, well, I guess she's not your mate sucks for you it's like a public proposal in a sense i'd also would probably shut the fuck down yeah i'd be like no we didn't talk about this and they're like well then you must compete in the competition which is over except for the one more challenge tomorrow josie being a real gal pal decides to try give uh saluk a fair shot at being the winner by making it a four-part challenge and if you win all four like she makes it so he could win he doesn't because everybody else tries to sabotage him the ones who already are behind are like okay i'm not gonna win but i can make sure that he doesn't win which also it's like again no one wants tiffany's best interest it's like <laughs> i just want to win none of these guys are like i want her to be happy so i'm gonna bow out exactly he fucks saluk i i'm not gonna win so he, the one that she actually is <laughs> shown interest in he's not gonna win either so he doesn't win and so this other young like the youngest of the competitors wins and he's going to escort josie and tiffany to the elders cave so they can get the language dump and then uh hayden out of nowhere pops in and is like no this is unsafe you should not take the human women this is a bad idea and ahako's like hayden calm the fuck down and everybody's like wow josie and hayden really don't get along i wonder what that could mean for the next book <laughs> enemies to lovers they go off uh on the journey tiffany's really tired josie's a little more capable so luke of course is like i am absolutely not going to sit this one out i'm going to follow them from a distance and make sure everything is okay and then tiffany ends up spraining her ankle it's not going well and he just busts in and the young guy's like fuck you why'd you do this and he was like she obviously likes me more like calm down and the young guy's like you're right i was wrong instantly resolved so they get to the elders cave josie wanted to go to get the iud out but the thing the med bay thing is out of uh commission and then they discover there is a giant snow hurricane heading for the region and they must tell the tribes but tiffany's leg is broken her ankle's really swollen it's not broken and so they're like well the young guy can go to the south caves because it's farther and he'll be able to tell them but who's going to go to the normal caves and josie's like i'll do it guys i am capable i am strong i am woman hear me roar and tiff's like no josie it's dangerous don't do it let saluk go and then she's like who the fuck is gonna take care of us if we're trapped here in the ice cave no i'm going you stay. I'm a Girl Scout. I'm going to go. <laughs> I can make a compass in some water. And she goes. And credit to Josie. Credit where credit's due. Josie gets there. And all the ladies are like, oh, Josie, lovely to see you. We're all, we all have babies. And Josie's super jealous. And she's like, by the way, 
hurricane coming. The other guy you assume gets there. So Luke and uh, Tiffany have a gay old time because uh, at this point he's like, I like you a lot. And she's like, I like you too. And he's like, you shall be my mate. Even if we don't resonate, you are my mate. And she's like, I like this. So they decide to have sex. It goes really well. He lets her lead for everything. Utter gentleman. She's so entranced until he starts getting so turned on. He cannot control himself. Things go great. They resonate, or they don't resonate. They, they have sex, and then they resonate. And then they go back to the tribe, and everybody's super happy. And then Josie's like... After a two-week fuck session. Let's put that up there. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're in this they're cave for like, two weeks. Yeah, they're just boning the entire time. They keep running out of food and fuel, and so eventually it's like, okay, I guess I'll leave and take care of you since you can't walk. Fine, I guess I'll, I'll remove my dick from you for a little bit so I can make sure we don't die in this elder cave that I hate. And I actually bookmarked a portion of their lovemaking. Oh, no. Of course you did. And I'm going to play it for you guys. And we'll oh, just... Great. Hopefully this will be the right right spot. And then he nuzzles at my folds, his tongue dragging over my sensitive flesh. Oh, sweet baby Jesus. That felt incredible. I shudder because I just felt every single ridge on his tongue go over my pussy. I'm getting wetter by the minute. And it doesn't matter how open and vulnerable this position is because I want that to happen again. Like yesterday. I get my wish. He pushes my folds apart with his seeking lips. And then his tongue drags all the way down my pussy from core to lips. <laughs> Tastes so good. He breathes, and I have to his horns as he starts to lick me slowly up and down over and over. A soft whimper escapes my throat because this is the most delicious kind of torture. His hands caress my booty as he licks me, exploring my folds with his tongue. And did I think his tongue felt good in my mouth? It's nothing compared to how it feels on my pussy. I shall wake you every morning with my face between your thighs and my tongue deep inside you. I shudder against him, crying out because he punctuates that thought by dragging his tongue against my core and then dipping the tip of it inside me. So good. He murmurs, all of the other hunters shall be jealous of the noises my mate makes as I pleasure her. They will wonder why I am so silent. And do you know why it will be so I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, there we go. <laughs> this, is, this is more than I needed. Thank you. I did not need to be with that. I'm, uh, I... So I will not be returning on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the, the robotic, the robotic pussy. Like that's, that's I'm done. He grabbed my booty. Like it's just, uh, also, please know, I think that was at double speed. No, that was 1.5. Yeah, no, that's fine. Still too long. No. <laughs> I anyway, love this, no. this book was more boring than some of the others. Yes. I found it sweet and I liked the initial plot, but that last third, like them stuck in the like cave. Once the competition ended, the book got real boring real quick and because you know what's going to happen. You know, you know, like I think if they had ever tried to make it seem like the guys were at all a threat to them, like then it would have been something. Or again, maybe it wasn't Saluk and it was the other guy that she rejected already months ago. Like maybe he just pops up and is like, I, I, I'm, I don't know what I did. But I, like maybe we could have gotten an apology or something. Oh, yeah. Like he doesn't know what he did, but he apologizes. Oh, that would be great. And then that makes like something flutter in her. And then she's like, wait a minute. Did I, did I judge him too soon? Did my anxieties ruin something good? Like there could have been something here. Some tension. <laughs> But no, it was just always like, okay, so eventually she's going to resonate for this dude. This author doesn't like love triangles, which I'm not a big love triangle person. I don't love them. But I think it could have added something. A little tension. A little tension. Because once she's comfortable with like touching him and you realize that she's getting over like the trauma stuff, the tension that was there is gone. And then it's just them in a cave for two weeks. And I- I think it's because he's too simple of a character. He's not really working through his understanding of her trauma. He's just immediately understanding of it. And like, so there's no real complications. There's no real tension between the two. At one point, I think he straight up tells her like, if you want good things in life, you can't focus on the bad that's happened. Like, it's some really weird victim blaming <laughs> bullshit. Like, yeah. I was, like, taken aback. I was like, I'm sorry, do you want to get naked now? Like, what are we... It was, like, at the worst timing, too. He read it on Instagram right beforehand. Oh, God, no. The way I read it was, like, guys who were like, well, some people can joke about their trauma. Why can't you? <laughs> like, that's what it took. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, all right. But before we go... We have to continue the tradition from last oh, no. episode. Amanda, since you weren't here that time, we'll... So, the four main leads, Harlow, Rook, Tiffany, and Saluk. You should ask her all of the five guys we've dealt with so far. No, 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 guys and gals. Guys oh. and gals from each of the book, fuck, marry, kill. <laughs> 
Um, so are we talking about the guys or the guys and the girls for the last two books? Guys and girls for the last two books. Okay. 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 Bisexual representation. I respect it. Um, <laughs> um, so. Oh, are you? that? Do you mention that in a video ever or three or four times? Yeah, I do week? actually. <laughs> <laughs> Me just openly <laughs> lusting. I think my last video from yesterday, I'm like, uh, yeah, Jessica Chastain and Diane Kruger should make out. What's going on? <laughs> that was a good idea, by the way. <laughs> um, but don't bark, please. We're, we're doing something very serious. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would not have sex with uh, Tiffany. I think that she has, I would try and find her a therapist. I think she should speak to the healer. because I think that's his best. See, if she had like some connection with like one of the elders, like I think that could have been something. Cause like those are the only people who could probably have anything. They've dealt with loss. They have probably dealt with some trauma. Like there should have been something there. And then that would have been a good healing other than just like men fix things like other than that. Okay. So we're going to get her an elder. Fuck Mary kill therapist. Yes. Um, Fuck, um, I'd marry Harlow. She seems capable. I don't want to kill Rio because that sounds mean. <laughs> you know, I'm going to kill Saluk because I can. Um, and then, no, I don't want to fuck the dirty caveman. <laughs> no. no. Okay, wait. Alternate. <laughs> Thank you, okay, I'm fucking Harlow. I'm marrying Saluk and I'm killing Rio. <laughs> I think that's a good choice. And then Tiffany just gets just gets all of the alcohol that she wants. Yes. Like whatever she wants, that's what she gets. She wants me to help her dig holes for her planting. I will help do that. Absolutely. All right. I think that is a good note to end this podcast on. Thank you, Amanda, for being on with us and suffering through these books. Yes, of course. Everybody go check out her channel. She's trying to build up a little bit of a crowd. She's a struggling <laughs> yes. actor in LA right now. Me and my uh, quarter million subscribers. Yeah, you know, just, just a small <laughs> channel. Channel. Trying to get by. Try me. It's a little bit of change. But if you would like to support my dreams of being on that grind, please go subscribe to Swell Entertainment on YouTube. And I also have my own podcast called Swell Shenanigans. That's way more chaotic than this one, surprisingly. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. This is fun. I really liked this. Thank you. We'd love to have you back on anytime yes. you want. I will find something. Oh, have you read the uh, Minotaur Milking Farm book? <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> Amanda, what? It's TikTok's other obsession. Um, or Morning Glory Milking Farm is what it's called. <laughs> and it's about, I haven't read it yet. So we'll all be going in blind. Perfect. All right, let's, I like let's this. go. Okay, well, I look forward to it. And dear viewers, subscribe if you would like to see that in the future. Leave us a comment. Which of our two different ideas of the spur, or the, our theories of the grasper or... Matcher. Is it grasper or, ra or matcher? <laughs> Leave in the comments below. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.